Hello, my name is Jan Vraný, and uh, before I start with today's presentation, I would first like to thank uh, everyone who makes this conference. I really like small talks, it's a great conference, and uh, I'm really happy that I can be part of it, uh, even though um, I cannot physically come, so at least, you know, in this, in this remote way. All right. As you may know, uh, I work at Loveware, and at Loveware I'm working on uh, virtual machines, compilers, debuggers, and, and that sort of thing. And today I'm going to talk about uh, Tiny Rosa. So what's Tiny Rosa? Tiny Rosa is a compiler library. So it's a library that uh, allows you to you know, transform <coughs> one program in one language uh, into, uh, into another language in this case, into a machine code or native code that can run on actual silicon. So if you've seen, if you've seen Boris's earlier presentation today, uh, this, is, this is the meat grinder uh, he was talking about. So it takes a program for one computer, perhaps an abstract computer, and produces a program for another computer, uh, in this case, a specific, uh, a specific architecture, like uh, x86, ARM, RISC-5, uh, you name it. Uh, I should say it's compiler backend library because it doesn't take you know, any arbitrary language, you know, such as Smalltalk or, or something else. Uh, it takes a program in an intermediate representation and then produces, produces a native code. So if you have a language, Smalltalk, let's say, uh, and want to use a tiny rosa to compile it, uh, you first have to transform it to this tiny rosa's intermediate representation. Tiny rosa is implemented completely in Smalltalk. You know, there is no other code than Smalltalk. Uh, and it provides a uh, few modes. One is JIT mode, so you can, you know, just in time, like the usual Smalltalk compilers do. Or you can compile in ahead of time mode. Uh, in that case, it produces uh, an object file, you know, a code on a disk, and then you can load the disk. Uh, you can load the code from disk later and execute it. So, using the AOT mechanism in a tiny rosa, you can, for example, pre-compile the whole small talk or, or a library uh, and ship uh, ship just the binary. It's also engineered in a in a flexible way, uh, so you should be able to uh, to tweak everything. Uh, we did a few experiments uh, earlier this year uh, that showed this flexibility. So, for example, we wanted to to do a semi-hosting call from an execu executable environment, let's say. So, in order to do semi-hosting, you, you have to execute specific instructions uh, and uh, TinyRSA didn't have any support for it, so it, so what we did just plug in, plug in a new. Uh, we did it with a linkage, uh, and I'm not going into details, but uh, you know, it, it proved to be quite quite flexible. Uh, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to uh, to show what um, what we did in, in the past year. Um, we did quite a lot of things. You know, there will be a lot of improvements here and there. Uh, since late spring, early summer last year, when I actually started working on it. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not going to to go uh, through all of these little little improvements or bigger improvements. But there are a few things that I think are interesting to mention. Uh, so I will just just show these. So the first uh, first thing I did is the support for bytecode to native compilers. Uh, I mean, you could do it before, but uh, I've just improved the support that it's uh, so much easier. Uh, this is because, uh, you know, I'm not saying that the bytecode is the only representation of a code from which you should compile, or from which you should JIT, if you will, or that the bytecode is the best one, but clearly it's very common. Uh, so, I wanted to have something that would facilitate uh, 
creation of these bytecode compilers, because as I said, Tiny Rasa compiles from intermediate code down to the native code, so we need to create this intermediate representation. And for this, I, uh, I have added a, you know, a special API that, um, that helps that. So, how does that look like? Uh, imagine you have a bytecode that uh, returns top of the stack. Most bytecodes uh, have something like this, mm, with a few variations. Uh, but generally, what the return top of the stack, uh, what it does. So it first, first uh, pops the value out of the stack and then returns it. So pops it out of the stack, you know, this is this, this BC pop, and then return. Pretty straightforward. You just do pretty much what, uh, what uh, the bytecode should do. And you have the intermediate representation, which Tiny Rasa then can compile. Uh, let's have a look at a, a different bytecode. So here we have a push integer. So what this does is it takes an integer, encodes it as a, as a small integer, because uh, in most small talks, integers are uh, tagged immediate values. And uh, Tiny Rasa intermediate representation is a bit lower, so it works with you know machine uh, machine integers, uh, not you know small integers or any any higher order tag values. So you first create the, the tagged representation, tagged small integer uh, value, and create constant with it, and push it on the stack here. And then you just go to the next bytecode. Uh, this tells Tiny Rosa, that once we are done with the bytecode, we just continue on the next one. So this is this go to. This doesn't necessarily mean that uh, in the generated code there will be any kind of uh, go to or jump or anything. Uh, this is just how to express that we continue on the next bytecode once uh, once uh, the job for this bytecode is done. Uh, this becomes uh, important when we start doing jumps. Because the jump uh, either jumps to some place or continues on some other place. So if we have a bytecode, let's say jump if true, and some distance in, in the bytecode, then uh, this is what you do. You pop the value out of the stack, which should be boolean, compare it with a true, because it's jump if true, and if they are equal, therefore the top of the stack is true, then you go to some bytecode. This is where you want to jump. And if not, then you go to the next bytecode. So that's it. Uh, I usually like to do little demos. So I've created a simple, uh, simple, just a toy uh, bytecode compiler using this API uh, and I'm going to run it on this very machine uh, which is uh, a nice little board uh, it's a vision 5 that's a you know single board computer uh, built around uh, uh, u74 risk 5 core you know that's that's a one relatively powerful risk 5 core designed by sci5 so we will run it uh, on this very machine. This is actually a picture from my home lab. So what we are going to do, we will compile a simple iterative factorial, sorry, with Tiny Rosa. Uh, we will make a single executable, uh, upload it to this machine and run it there. So that's, uh, that's what we are going to do. So here is my image with Tiny Rosa loaded. And... Uh, we just execute this example to get the compiled code uh, saved on a disk. Uh, okay, here's some leftover health. Anyway, uh, we just proceed. And we should uh, have a bit here. So if I do make, I compile the code. And now I have to upload it to that machine because I'm doing this presentation on my laptop. So I need to get it uh, on the on the board and here I am on the board so I run it 
So this actually runs uh, or computes a factorial of 20 uh, 1000 times. So it prints a result which I believe is correct uh, and also prints a time. So it takes a uh, hundred, roughly 100 milliseconds. That's what to be expected, I would say, from a simple straightforward uh, bytecode interpreter created the way, uh, way we did it. Um, you know, the way I outlined uh, uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, if you are curious what uh, interpreter does, and this is a squeak compiled for RISC-V, uh, running pretty much the same code, uh, and if you run it, uh, it runs roughly 10 times slower. That's the pure interpreter running on the same, very same machine. Okay, that's Probably enough of a demo for right now. Mm. So yeah, that was the that was the bytecode to native uh, compiler support. So you essentially do you know pushes and pops and uh, go to uh, uh, pretty much the same way you you would do it in the interpreter, uh, and then the tiny Rosetti with all of that and creates creates some code. Uh, Another uh, thing uh, I have added, which I find uh, important, is the debug info. So the debug info is important when you debug in. So when you are running a native code, or pretty much any other code, uh, you want to be able to see where you are in the source and inspect variables and things, things like this. So for this, you need to debug info. And it's actually Actually, it turns out that it's not only for for debugging when you are looking you know, for some problem in the code, uh, but for most high-performance VMs, this is also used at runtime when you do you know things like adaptive uh, optimization or deoptimization. Uh, if you do unstuck replacement and the kind of thing that pretty much all high-performance VMs do. So for that, you also need to debug info. Sometimes you call it metadata. Um, it's pretty much the same. It's about how to map the native code back to the source. So <clears throat> you can make these transitions or actually can make sense of sense of what's, what's going on. <clears throat> Sorry. So what you see here, this is an actually an inspector of a compilation object uh, in Dynerosa. So on the left, uh, uh, left column, you see the intermediate representation and the, each node in the intermediate representation uh, may have location object attached to it. Uh, in this code, the location object represents a bytecode index, but it can, it can be uh, an object that represents uh, you know, the traditional uh, file, line, and column. Uh, so I think it can be you know any other things uh, because the, from the compiler perspective the location is completely transparent it's something that is attached to the node and that gets propagated down to the instruction level uh, through the compilation process uh, but the compiler itself doesn't really uh, care about the details or you know about the API of the object it only just Propagates the propagates the objects uh, through the different compilation phases. Uh, so once you've done this compilation, you just can see okay what is the location of this instruction, uh, where this variable is located in a stack, and, and things like this. So uh, that was another thing, and the last thing um, is I've added some optimizations and. Uh, those who, who have heard my first presentation about Tiny Rosa like a year, year and a half ago, uh, I said that I don't want to do optimizations or many optimizations just to keep things simple. And you know, there is an awful lot of do you can do optimization wise. But uh, I wanted to avoid it. But then as I was as I was progressing on Tiny Rasa and playing with things and trying to compile different uh, different pieces of code, 
uh, and looked at the code that it produced and I was like, oh, this is, uh, this is not that nice. You know, I can do better if I just tweak this little bit. Uh, so I tweak uh, uh, things a little bit here and there. Uh, and before long, I found myself deep in this optimization business. Uh, so yes, in the end, uh, I started uh, started doing uh, optimizations, uh, pretty much like uh, everyone else, really. Uh, I think it's time for another demo to actually see the effect of the few optimizations. I haven't done much, just you know, a few basic ones. Uh, but it might be interesting to see the effect of those optimizations on the uh, on the runtime. So I have uh, another another demo here. And if we if we look here, uh, this is the test case for the for the first demo I've shown uh, uh, before. And this demo is exactly the same, compiles exactly the same code, like uh, exactly the same source, let's say. Uh, the only difference is that it employs a number of optimizations. Uh, so this is this is this. I'm not going to. Uh, go into detail what they do. We can probably do it later, or you know, we can talk uh, offline about it. Uh, but just let's see, you know, how much how much they uh, affect the the runtime performance. So we compile again, and yeah, that's that's our health again. So it's proceed. Now it should be compiled, and we have to go back to my machine. Um, we compile again. We upload again the new optimized version, and uh, we run the optimized version here. And you see, it produces the same result as in previous case, uh, but it runs roughly 10 times faster. So that's the effect of those few optimizations uh, that I've done. Uh, 10 times millisecond. Yeah, that's much better than, than 100 milliseconds, and clearly much better than 1000 milliseconds. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all I've done uh, with respect of optimizations mm, so far. Uh, if you are curious how GCC performs in this case, and I was curious, uh, I did a try, and the GCC is very, very good. So GCC optimized this down. Uh, to one millisecond, so that's another ten times, uh, ten times uh, faster than the tiny Rosa with optimizations. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're not yet there, and GCC is known for being very aggressive in optimizations, and they do a very good job. Right, um, let's talk about this optimization in a little bit, a uh, uh, little bit more detail. Because I, I found it quite interesting. So, one of the optimizations I'm doing is this if compare optimizations, or something I called if compare optimization, uh, which uh, transforms the intermediate representation represented here by the tree, because uh, in Tiny Rosa, uh, intermediate representation, sorry, intermediate representation is actually a tree. Uh, so it it transforms this tree, which uh, roughly corresponds uh, to the small tall code which is above it, uh, to, to something much simpler. So, if you have a look, this is what you can do. And you might you might wonder, you know, who would who would write uh, the original code? You know, a equals b, uh, all that equals true. Maybe nobody would write it, but that might be a result of another optimization. So that's that's the common problem with optimizations that you you do something, uh, and that produces some form of code, and then that form of code opens up possibilities for another sort of optimizations. So even if nobody would really uh, write code like this, mm, situations like this happen at some point uh, during the compilation. So this is uh, this is what you do. So you don't really need to compare here. Um, yeah, you don't need to compare the result of the comparison. Compare it again, whether you know the comparison is one, 
right? You can just compare the A and B directly and do the jump. That's the if I C and B and E. That is if left child uh, is equal to the right child, then do the jump. Sorry, it's not equal. That's the N E. Then do jump. Otherwise, continue. Now, uh, the tricky thing is, uh, is this optimization correct or is it correct in all cases? Now, you might think it is, you know, it's obvious that uh, you can simplify the code like this. Uh, but the truth is, it's not always obvious, you know, there are more complicated optimizations. That's one problem. Uh, the other problem is, uh, as Boris said, you know, today's computers are really different from you know, what were the computers uh, before. So they are no longer strictly sequentially consistent uh, unit processor things. Uh, they are massively multi, uh, multi core. Uh, they have this uh, weak memory consistency models and, uh, and whatnot. So essentially, these days, when you execute an instruction, you cannot really say you know, in what state the computer will be. You know, it can be in, in multiple different states depending on something. You don't, uh, you don't really uh, know on what because you don't see inside. You know, remember, remember the Boris, uh, uh, Boris uh, computers, you know, these buttons that they poof uh, and really smoke. You, you don't know what is inside. So that's the same with, with modern CPUs and the architecture uh, specification uh, all it gives you is is like like an envelope of a states. It say okay, you know this will hold this this you know this here are the boundaries, but within the boundaries anything can happen. So we need a more assurance that uh, everything is correct, and that's that's you know one of the main driving forces behind all our project uh, and also behind the tiny rosa that uh, we need to architect things in a way that we can prove that what we do is actually correct based on some formal methods so this is what i'm going to show in the second half of the presentation how to actually make sure and prove that uh, this simple optimization that is obviously correct that is actually correct. Uh, so, how to do it? Uh, it might look it's you know really tricky, uh, but uh, once you have the uh, right tools and uh, machine arithmetic provides those tools, uh, it's relatively simple. It's all a matter of modeling uh, this optimization properly, uh, and then just uh, letting the machine arithmetic to do the magic and tell us whether it's okay or not. So, how do we model it? Uh, first, we need to model the individual operations within the tree. Mm -hmm. So, we will start with the icons, which is a simple opcode that just yields or returns uh, a constant value. One in this case, but generally any, any integer constant. We model it as a function. So, it's a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. And uh, what the function does, it returns the constant. Uh, that's very simple. If I see P Q is a similar, but uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, what if I see P Q does is uh, it compares the left subtree or expression or node, if you will, with the right one. And if they are equal, it uh, returns one, otherwise returns zero. So again, we model it as a function, which takes an integer. That's the first expression. Another integer, that's the second expression and produces yet another integer, uh, which is either one or zero. Uh, also relatively simple. If I see MP uh, and E is a little bit tricky. 
So what if I CMP NE does uh, is that it compares left node and right node, and if, we are, if they are not equal, uh, then continue execution one way or jumps to one label if you want. Uh, and if they are equal, uh, then it continues or jumps to another label or evaluates a different continuation. Uh, that's all pretty much the same thing. So again, it's a function that takes an integer, takes uh, another integer, that's the second you know, left and right child, and then takes two, let's say, continuations or labels. Uh, and produces another. That's the that's the continuation or label, uh, which uh, you know which way the code would go, or the execution would go uh, once it compares uh, the left and right. So again, it's a function that take that compares uh, expression one and expression two. And if they are not equal, it jumps, goes one way. Uh, and if they are equal, then it continues or you know goes goes a different way. The execution goes on a different way. So we have now the model, the formalization of all nodes we need. Uh, we don't need the A and B because they can be arbitrary. Uh, subtrees, so we just take them as a as a value. We don't really care what what they are. Uh, and the next next step uh, we need is uh, we need uh, to model the whole fragment, you know, the whole tree. And uh, then what we will do, we will just make sure that this uh, original fragment, this blue tree. Uh, and the simplified fragment or optimized fragment uh, that was the green tree, uh, that they always produce the same observable behavior, if you want. So this is the function, again, uh, the function original that takes an integer, uh, another integer, those are these a and b's, uh, and uh, two continuations, whether to jump or just continue and produces the continuation or label. That is, which way it would continue once you are executing, once you execute all this, all these nodes. And in the body, you just, uh, you know, execute first expression, second expression, or evaluate it. Then you compare them, and then you compare the result of the comparison uh, with one. Using those functions we defined, uh, we defined earlier for the individual operations in, within the tree. Uh, the optimized or simplified version, uh, we do exactly the same. Uh, we just uh, create a function that represents or formalizes uh, the optimized tree or simplified. Uh, and the last thing uh, we need to do is uh, we just create a function I call it justify, uh, which takes arbitrary a and b values and two continuations, and we just evaluate the original tree, the original version of the code, and the simplified version of the code or the optimized one, and we assert that no matter what, uh, both would yield the same value. That's this c assert. And now, when we have all these uh, definitions and all these functions, we just throw them on, a, on the prover, a machine arithmetic, in this case. Uh, and the prover would either tell it's safe, and then everything is fine, or it will tell unsafe, and then there is some problem, and you need to investigate. Now, keep in mind that this is not testing or the classical testing when you have a set of a test values and you just check okay whether for this test vector it produces the correct or expected answers 
This does this for every possible value. So, you know, it's a mathematical proof. It's not a test. So, that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to show. Uh, I don't have how, I don't know how much time we have, but um, yeah. Uh, you may find Tiny Rosa on GitHub uh, if you are interested in it. Uh, if we have uh, time for questions, I'm ready to answer any questions you might have now. If uh, if you come up with some questions or you know, uh, think of something uh, later, uh, down here is my email. Uh, feel free to drop me an email. I would be uh, excited to to talk about and answer any questions you might have.